So firstly, uh, welcome Trushan and welcome Mark. Um, I really appreciate you guys coming. Uh, what we're trying to do in this interview session is we're trying to understand basically what a good TVET lecture is. That's a question which we're asking. And we're trying to get a handle on what that kind of a person is because we feel that the more we can get what a good TVET lecture is out there in the South African space and start to research it, the more we can actually start to educate and train up good TVET lecturers, which is actually one of the bigger projects we're involved with. Um, so basically, I'm just going to be asking you questions about what your experiences of a good, uh, of a good lecturer are. And you're welcome to use yourselves. That's why you're here. Uh, and you're welcome to use other people. Um, and what I'd like to start off by doing is um, basically start off by asking you a very kind of broad question. And that is, if you had to describe what your idea of like a really good TVET lecturer is in your field, in the engineering field, what would you say that kind of person has to be? I would say you must have multitude of skills. Communication, understanding, to be able to deal with students, management, everyday situations, uh, technical skills, hands-on experience, also how to get curriculum across to students. So that's, it's almost like on the one level he's got to have like some kind of project project management skills is kind of one of the things where you've got to hold all sorts of different things together as one kind of a, one kind of a thing. You've got numerous positions. It's not like before where you're a teacher, you teach, that's it. With, with current day situations and everything we've got with student problems and you've got to be a mother, you've got to be a father, you've got to be a teacher, you've got to be an educator, you've got to be a policeman sometimes. Yeah. So you've got to have, be able to have all those skills. It's even possible at certain days. Everybody have bad days. Yeah. But uh, you've got to have, try and have it most of the time, I would say. Okay. okay. Can I just add to that? As well? yeah. I, I think another important aspect TVET lecturers should possess is this ability to construct knowledge. Yeah. If they have that in the back of their mind, how do you construct knowledge? And if they bring that into their, their lecture room or their classroom, it just helps to, to make this job of being an educator so much more successful because you are broadening your horizons. You're not just coming in and saying, okay, I've got a curriculum to teach, so I'm just teaching it. Yeah. But you're, you're asking yourself this question. Constructing, so you're saying they've got to be experts at, they've got to be good at constructing knowledge. Yeah. Like, uh, what do you mean by that? I don't, I'm not quite sure I get it. So what, what do you mean by constructing? If they understand it, how, knowledge is accumulated yeah. is, is it just something that's dispensed is am i a person who's just going to come there and take this textbook and and just ensure that whatever is in this textbook is now uh, uh, given to that student yeah. dispensed to that student yeah. then i'll just come there and i can write down all the notes on that board and ensure that it's given okay. but if i look at this curriculum and if i understand that if a child needs to learn and understand what this curriculum is mm. It, it's not just a matter of dispensing this information yeah. to you. There, there is more than just a, an information... Uh, uh uh, yeah, more than a download almost, yeah. hey? So that's why you're using the word construction. That's, okay, okay. Um, Tarushan, you, you want to say something on that? I would also say the way you construct it, how you go about giving that curriculum. Because there's many ways you've got a curriculum, and sometimes I don't agree with curriculum yeah. at certain points. The way they set out that they want us to do tasks, and to be honest, I don't follow that because mm. sometimes I know it's not in the best interest of my students. Yeah. Even the way sometimes I feel the curriculum is laid out, I don't go according mm. to that. I might go and do a module that's at the end and then bring it up to the module in the beginning okay. because I feel they work better from my experience. So you, so one of the qualities of being a good lecturer in a TVET college is, is that you take control of the actual uh, selection, sequencing and pacing of the curriculum. You're following it, but within your own professional judgment, at certain points you say, uh-uh, this doesn't make sense to do it now, I want to do it here. 
and this activity doesn't make sense doing it like this, I'm going to do it like that. I feel like certain modules work better together or in a different sequence because they support one another better. Yeah. It, it builds on understanding and uh, learning for the students. Okay. Okay, so now let's, let's take it from that. That's a very broad start, right? We're going to go into a lot more detail because we've really got to kind of like, kind of interrogate this. Um, but one of the senses I've got when I've talked to you guys and other people is that being a good lecturer is actually slightly different when you're teaching the NCV on the one side and the NATED on the other. It's almost like they expect two different kinds of lectures, although if you're good, you can be one to both. What are the two kinds of lecturers which are expected within the NCV and the NATED programs? Uh, with, with me personally, I've taught, I think, half of my teaching experience has been NATED, mm. and I've gone into the NCV program. Uh, with the NATED, it's, you just got a curriculum, and you've got to teach it. Mm. Uh, it's, it's changed a bit because when NATED was created, uh, Report 191, mm. All our students that came in came in from industry. They yeah. they had that practical know-how. They knew what we we're talking about. I spoke about a transformer. In their mind, they knew what it was because they had that industry experience. Okay. But now we're getting students straight out of school who have none of that. Uh, so, so it's and and you also look at the time frame that you have for report one nine one. Like over the years, in my last years when we were teaching. The, the amount of time we had for teaching just got shorter and shorter and shorter. Like I know people used to say back then you had about 10 weeks to 12 weeks to teach the curriculum. Oh uh, yeah. And then now we've got about 8 weeks. So uh, how, how come? Um, the, way, the way the layout's been done, the way the timetable's been set for exams to start for some. Also with strikes, with the, with the, with uh, the strike okay. action. Okay. Uh, also we had used to have problems with the um, releasing of results. Yeah. Like, I know sometimes the, the timetable would say you would get results on this day. But we have had instances where results took one week, two weeks, sometimes three weeks to arrive. Yeah. So that delayed the whole process. Uh, we did make contingency plans. We said we'll put you all temporarily ahead, start teaching. Mm -hmm. But that opened up our own can of worms, another can of worms. Because then when we told students you didn't pass, you had to go back yeah. and they refused. But also on that, yeah. all it shows was we, lecturers adapted the new kind of student yeah we basically got them to learn to pass so and and so the ncv lecturer is the guy that's teaching them to pass that's uh, that's what a good lecturer is no with, well with the report 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 191 yeah. with the way the curriculum is set uh, set out you've got so much to learn and you've got two tests to write for your icas mark okay and then you write a final exam okay but it's only the theory. Um, it's only these set of questions. And yeah. also, if you go back and you look, okay, recently they have been making changes, changing examiners, mm -hmm. the way they ask questions. But for a good number of years, it was the same question yeah. over and over and over. So basically, if I was testing this module, basically I had five types of questions. Mm. Me as a lecturer would ensure my student knows all five questions yeah. and what the answers could be. Okay. And then students with this kind of exam just had to memorize. Mm. Because we've had cases where students, like I've seen it, they come from the lower levels, brilliant marks. Yeah. And with those marks you would justify when I took them at the higher level and I asked them a basic question. They didn't know. If it wasn't in the, if it wasn't what they'd learned off by heart. Yeah. But what they'd learned off by heart, did they understand it? Uh, no. You're learning, you're learning to pass. Rote learning. Yeah. No. You're learning to Okay, so now we're going to get into that because I think that's going to talk to the different ways that students are engaging with the um, curriculum and different way lecturers are actually teaching the curriculum. Um, yeah, because even as myself, as a lecturer, you could see you've got a module that has five subsections. Mm. But you could see over the last five years, an examiner is only testing a two section. Yeah. And we've seen lecturers only teach two then sections that come out. You teach the you, two. You teach the two because it's a, yeah. because also of the time frame. You've got limited time yeah. to teach, so they try to get the student prepared as much. Mm. You need to get the pass rate up because yeah. management wants to see your pass rate. Yeah. So the trick is focus on less. Do it. Do they do it well? 
and get them to pass or do it so that they learn it off by heart to pass. But also, uh, put the pressure lecturers are under, you can do it well, get them to learn, get them to understand and a student will understand because he knows the theory, he knows the work, yeah. but he could fail the final. And all that shows on you is, many people say, no, your pass rate is too bad. Yeah. But they're not looking at what the students are learning. So that's also adjusted the way lecturers think. Just get them to pass. So the, so the consequence is, if you try to be a good lecturer in terms of like saying, I've got to get these guys to learn these skills and I've got to make sure that they actually do these things properly, then what happens is, or learn these things properly, what happens is it comes to an exam that isn't what comes up in the exam because you've been trying to teach them how to do the whole thing. Mm. Student fails or does very badly. You as a lecturer trying to do your job will end up not looking really good with the... Um, because at the end of the day, nowadays you are assessed on your pass rate. Yeah. So it comes down to competency. Are we teaching competency? Or are we teaching students to just pass an exam? Now, wh what do you understand by competency? What is it? What is it? What is it to be? Is it, is it to be competent, or what's like? What's this word, competency? Competent. If a student is competent in what he's able to do, then he's acquired a skill, and then you are progressively training him to be prepared to go up for a trade test, an evaluation at that level so that he can be deemed able to carry out certain functions at work, wherever he's employed. So his employability depends on his competency, not necessarily on his pass mark. Okay, but now, that competency, is that competency, for example, is it, a, is it quite a low-level competency? In other words, is it that you can do a certain task with a certain set of skills and show that you can do the, the task properly? Or is it a situation where you're given quite a complex set of things to do, where you've got to problem solve and work out context, work out situations, come up with what needs to be done in a slightly ambiguous space and work out how to do, to, is that what it is to be competent? Or is competent, you get given one set, of, one task to do with a couple of skills attached and as long as they can do those couple of things, you're competent. It, it depends. There's two, there's two aspects to that. Compet uh, competency on that level that you're speaking about, complex levels of, uh, yeah. of uh, working out different dynamics related to a task, doesn't just happen. Just, you don't just go there. Yeah. You will start with small le levels of complexity. Mm. And as a student is able to engage with those levels, then we come in with this aspect of scaffolding. To, to get you to come to that level of complexity, we have to scaffold you to that place. And as you develop an understanding of the concepts, you are able to go to higher levels and higher levels. Because when you're standing before a machine which is highly automated, yeah. you cannot just go there and be able to carry out the repairs and fall find on that machine mm. if your levels of competency hasn't been gradually scaffolded to that yeah. point. And an and artisan must be able to do that. A competent artist. But now, what you're saying is that type of competency, where you're starting to say you've got to start with like some very basic skills, then what happens is the skills build up a little bit, and then once they're built up to a certain point, they start to be able to problem solve and think their way through what the workplace actually demands. That's not what's going down in the TVET college if you're talking about this situation where you trying to get through the curriculum. One and one doesn't do that at all. It doesn't address those aspects of it because you can get a student who has finished at N6 level who still doesn't know how to use a multimeter because he's never had a multimeter in his hand and yet he's done so many years of study. But isn't he going into a workshop and working with the tools at some point? At the uh, report 191 Nothing. has no interaction with tools mm. and workshops. Nothing. They are only there for theoretical knowledge. Is it that's why I say that was, that's the but mistake we've made because mm -hmm. remember, Report 191 was initially for students coming from industry exactly. and we haven't changed that. So mm -hmm. we are now getting students from schools mm -hmm. and they haven't got that background. So we haven't, the curriculum hasn't catered for that. So we just, lecturers have catered for it. Mm -hmm. so, so, we, so they actually don't know what it is, what it is that they're actually doing. They've got no actual experience of the thing which they're actually supposed to be working on. 
also the context <coughs> back then technicians and artisans all of that they did the minimum N2 and N3 because it was enough for them to get a trade test which was yeah. more rated it was more highly rated because that's what you needed for industry to work trade test you go into industry yeah so basically you needed the N2 and the N3 that's how they would come in and they would go there like I've spoken to older guys who've been there and they said well, around their time, N2, N3 was the minimum things you've done because it needed you to qualify an industry yeah. it. N4, N5, N6 were for the people who were looking to get into management. So it was very uh, few. You yeah. didn't get a lot of them. Yeah. Yeah. Even now, you go and see all these highly qualified older artisans and mm. you go and check their qualifications. It's N2, N3. But now we are pushing out so many students with N6 and you would think that Compared to back then, if you came out of N6, you were at a certain level, yeah. it's no more the same. Okay. Um, I hear that. And that's because you're saying, on one level, they didn't have the practical experience. They didn't know what it was that they were working with in the first place. Now, now for me, now it just seems we are a place to get people to go somewhere, to get them off the streets instead yeah. of staying at home, yeah. go to the TV and get this. But we aren't actually helping. Well, we're going to get more and more because we're going to, we're not going to double the amount of people coming to TVET. We're going to like triple and quadruple the numbers. That's all we're looking at doing, you know, in the next 10 years or so. Uh, we're going to ramp up the numbers enormously. Um, but let's, let's, let's stay with this thing about what an ideal lecturer would be in the complexity of the space where you're sometimes not actually kind of teaching them to become uh, competent in the field that they're working in. You're holding on to them so that they're actually doing something. And often what they're doing is they're just learning the knowledge base that they need, not how to do it and not what it is. Is that, is that a fair... Is that a fair yeah, yeah, it's fair. Because right now, if you look at your learning and teaching tools, it's a textbook. Uh, past your papers and more importantly a memo students mm. are learning to see a question mm. they are learning to see a memo answer and they are learning to get that done so now what's so now what's happened to that old kind of uh, lecturer the kind of the oak from industry it was the guy who knew his stuff he'd done it for years and what would happen is you'd come into his classroom and he, he would he would teach you a technique. And you would learn to apply it. Yeah. Uh, they have learned to adapt. Because that lecturer there, even though with all his experience, all of his all his knowledge, just isn't good enough if your pass rate is two percent. Uh, you are getting ridiculed. In some it's, cases it's you would get warning letters from management. Mm -hmm. What's happening? You have to really explain. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have to explain why is your pass rate so low. I had that experience. I came from industry. Yeah. And in the first trimester that I taught this class, <laughs> I had this perception that, let me take this textbook, but let me make it relevant. Yeah. Because it's just not relevant. You know, it, it, there's, there's too much of theory in it, but mm. it's, it's not relating to industry. And my pass rate was dismal. <laughs> Took the whole thing, went back, said, told myself, you know what, this is not going to work. Mm. I can't teach them what they need to know I need to teach them to pass. Yeah. Because it's gonna be like I'm not doing my job. Yeah. I also unfortunately unfortunately by by changing and adapting it mm. so that they pass, I really wasn't doing my job. So now how okay, so now how do you solve that problem? Okay, so that's what we want to know. So now let's say you're a good T vet lecturer, right? Which you guys are. And let's say now you're sitting with that as an issue. Now that's a real existential dilemma. I mean, you're in a situation where your heart and your experience is telling you one thing, and on the other side, what's being demanded of you within the TVET space is pushing you in another direction. How do you resolve that tension? Right now, I teach NCV, and I love the principle and the idea behind NCV. Give them a little bit of theory, give them a little bit of practical. The, the main idea, how you said, mm. and then this idea about with NCV, you'll be doing more practical work and you'll get, get the, them to be more practical. It makes sense, everything in writing, all of this good. Yeah. But when I went into NCV and the subject I teach, electronic control and digital electronics, one of the worst pass rates ever. And only when I went into it, I realized why. 
I can never do the amount of practical that they want because of the amount of theory and the syllabus they've got. It is, it is so, there is so much. So, so now with the NCV, so d now it's different, okay, to the report 191, we right? Do, we do theory you and we do You're supposed to be doing both. Yes. But now you're saying you're doing both, but you actually can't do both. You can't do both. Like with me, when I, I went into my subject, the pass rate was what, what, 0%, 2%. Mm. And then in the first uh, year that I took over, I got it to about 70% pass mm -hmm. rate. And everybody was like, oh, you did this. But there was a catch. I brought the report 191 teaching mm -hmm. into it. Seriously? And I, because <laughs> I went through, I looked at, I, what I noticed with uh, mm -hmm. NCV past year, I mean past year papers, every year it is very different. Mm -hmm. It's not like report 191 where you can spot papers. Uh, okay. So basically I went with the uh, overviews, what they needed to learn, and I only focused on that. Okay. So I would turn to module one, there's five overviews you need to learn. I didn't even open the rest. I said, guys, let's look at the overview. First question, what do they want you to mm -hmm. learn? Right, let's turn to the book. Underline here, underline here, underline here. Mm -hmm. This is important. And I got them to make notes there. And so basically now, when they, when they were writing my trials, I said, don't worry about the textbook. There's the overviews. Yeah. You learn everything there. And by doing that, your pass rate went up to from like 2%, 1% to 70%, 70%. And you were like the new hero on the block. Yes, and then... And I did that the first time because I needed to bring change. And then the next block when I went back to let's do this now the proper way, let's mm. focus on the practical. And my pastor talked about 30 percent. So how do you deal with it, Mark? I firstly want to hear what if you're still doing that, okay? But I firstly want to hear what Mark's doing. Then we must come back to if that's your current practice, how do you get out of it, right? So I want to get I want to come back to that. The native was very similar to what uh, Thiru is saying, where we just found ways in which we could get students to pass. Mm. So you teach them from that perspective, because you can't show them any practicals anyway. Mm. You don't have a workshop to work from, or if, even if you do bring anything to show the, your students. It's either a simulation or a video or something that relates to industry, but they're not practically engaging yeah. with it. And you can see the difference. So, so you're saying that if you do, you do, do you use lots of videos and that kind of stuff. So do you, do you show them simulations? You show them like versions of what they're supposed to be doing. They can watch a video which shows them how to do it. We do that for for NCV. Yeah, for the native as well. I used to do. It. Oh, okay. Uh, but I tried something different with the native. I, I was teaching NCV, and I was teaching native on a part-time basis. Mm. So I asked permission from my campus manager and from the program director who was running the part-time division if I could take the native students and bring them into a workshop environment on certain days during the, uh, the duration of that course. Oh, okay. So we set aside some of the uh, lessons to, mm. be, to become practical lessons. And you saw a massive shift in comprehension and understanding of what they were doing because now we were not just looking at specific things in that textbook or yeah. like drawings as well. Yeah. What I did was I, I, I looked at the drawings but when we brought this thing into a workshop environment and then we started to work with it from that place, mm. it was such a major difference where the students, you know, the light came on. Yeah. So they knew what it was that you were actually working with. Yes. It, it, mm. it, with, with the engineering uh, mm. into trade mm. theory, it's one of the hardest subjects because mm. You got to look at parts of the motor, and, and in the picture they'll show you like a front view of an armature. And yeah. it's, just, it's just a circle. Mm. They don't know what it is. Mm. And then when you, even if you take the student, you put all these parts in front of them. Say, which one is the armature? A real life part. Mm. They have no idea. But now when you they can't recognize it. Even out of everything, they don't know what it is. From the book, they wouldn't know. But if like you do what Mark did, and he takes them into the workshop, and he's teaching the same module yeah. now, and he says armature, and he says, guys, yes. He got a real life model. Yeah. Here's the armature, he pulls yeah. it out. This is what they're talking about. Yeah. When you explain how it spins and the 360 degrees, you can show them, you can manually turn it and say, see how the armature is moving, look at your windings, look at your field, okay. all, all of that. It, it makes, it, 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 it improves understanding. But now, does it then, surely it then improves their marks? Because surely now what must happen, I'm just checking, I don't know. 
But okay, so you got the guy, you're doing your technique, which you're talking about, right? You do the overview, you get them to learn it, they mark 70%, that's fantastic. But now if you take this approach, what happens is when they do go back to read the actual curriculum, aren't they reading it with more understanding? And aren't they now going, oh, so it actually, so that now it means this. So doesn't it mean that the chances are their marks are going to improve on top of them actually being able to do it or not? Is that like, is that La La Land dream space? I, I have seen understanding improve dramatically. Yeah. Because what you're talking about, the student can relate to it. Now. Yeah. You know, it's like you're getting more engagement from them. Yeah. Uh, they're relating more to the subject matter material that you be, you're discussing. But I notice a funny aspect about this. Some of the students who grasped it very well in the practical course mm. did not necessarily do very well in the test after that. Yeah. I don't know whether they became overconfident yeah. and they felt, hey, you know what, I, I know this thing, yeah. I don't need to learn it. Yeah. So those aspects also became yeah. visible. Where I'm sure that must happen. Yeah. I'm, I, mean, yeah. I, I mean, I know it's like that. I don't know. I'm one of them. So <laughs> you become a bit confident, you say, yeah. I, don't, I know this, but yeah. when you see it in paper and asking yeah. a question, yeah. One word goes off, you don't understand the word. Yeah. Even though you know the answer for it, yeah. the questions throw you off. Yeah, so. yeah. Uh, okay, so, so for some of them it's like that. Uh, are there the Oaks that can, can cover the range and they do, they do well in the exams, they're doing well in the practical components and you see them actually going off successfully or on the whole is it, aren't there guys who are saying, why we do, we just want to learn this stuff and pass and get out of here or whatever. I mean, aren't there people who are resentful about the fact that you're taking them into the workshop? We have students who come and ask us, just give us the memo. Mm. If you give them a question, you try to explain to them. Like when I was in native, because I was in the N5 and N6 level, they are slightly higher, they are a bit more mature. I was a bit strict. Yeah. So I always used to tell them, no, 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 no. I'll give you the memo, but you'll do it in class yeah. because we work it out. I would teach them a technique, how to answer a question, and they would get, I would give them question papers, no memos. Your job is to go and ask, and then I stop the group work where I will do it on the board. Okay. You come individually to me and you show me where you, what you are, and I can work with you. Yeah. Because half of the class will just sit and wait for the answer and yeah. the board take it on. Yeah. So I forced them to start working. And it improved my N5, my N6 class, yeah. uh, results were better, they understood. It also helped with their math skills because you learn how to do calculations. Yeah. So that's why I forced it. Instead of copying the calculations yeah. down. Because uh, easier way out, I could just give them the memos. Half of them would not come the next day because the work is done. And that, that's what would happen. Yeah. So I would force them and attendance would improve. Because if you, and I would always tell them, like with some of the engineering work we do, it's building blocks. Yeah. You can't go to step three without step one and two. So I would force them to attend classes. So you, you're trying to force them to not only know what it is that they're doing and how they're doing it, but you're actually trying to get them to think it through themselves, right? Mm -hmm. You're trying to say, guys, if you're going to do this, you have to take some, yeah, you have to take some responsibility, responsibility here. But You've got to take control of some of your own processes. But, but it's hard. It's if, if, like with new students coming in, it, it's nice to get them when they're young yeah. and introduce that at the beginning. I thought it was nice to get them when they're old. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Teaching them how to work, to how to understand, how to do these techniques. Because we have different level of classes. Yeah. Like we might have at N2, six classes. Those six classes might have three different lecturers. Uh, okay. So okay, let's say for us now, we are running the N5 classes. Yeah. I'm teaching two, you are teaching two, you are teaching two. I'm teaching two this way to understand. Now when we go to N6, if I get some of your learners, I am teaching the same way I've been teaching, expecting them and to they follow it because they're yeah. not used to it. Yeah. So in my college, I used to insist, I want my N5 students to come. Oh, you'd carry them through? Because otherwise you default, you have to default to the level where everyone else is getting Because I'm teaching them a technique and it also made my life easier in N6 because now they understood how I work. I give you a question, you answer it, there's no... But now what about the, the... Isn't that unfair to all the other students? I Didn't you have a situation where the students were like, we I want to get into your I class? Once in N3, 
the class number went to what 98 in the class and in a small room and they all refused to move and then finally I just told our management I will not be teaching anymore because I cannot breathe in the class and basically what they did was split the class into three and they made me teach the whole three. <laughs> made you teach three in a, three in a row? Yeah, well, they basically they took that old three, they put it into three classes or two classes or so, and then I had to teach both all the students. There. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. No. yeah, they split instead of giving me yeah. one room with ninety students. Yeah, they gave me those two classes now with like 45, 45. But then you have to teach them twice. Yeah. So that doubles your load, well, doesn't it? With with our current day situation in CV, I've got three, what three level twos. Yeah. I still I'm repeating each thing with each class. Oh uh, really? So yeah. it's you get used to it. Okay. I know some people would like that if you got the if you're teaching all three same levels like in native. Yeah. Just let's prep. I prep once and I get it done. No, for sure. Yeah. So for some people yeah. that would be ideal. Yeah. So it's okay. Okay. Just so going I'm back to that other point that you made, do they show any uh, interest uh, with the with the practical tasks that I had given them and asked them to come to the workshop? Mm. They had to travel a, a distance to come to the workshop, so it cost them. Is it not where? How? Where's the workshop in relation to our our afternoon classes or evening classes are scheduled in a different campus? Oh, okay. So, and that campus is centrally in town. Oh, okay. Uh, to use the workshops, they had to come all the way to North Deal. But what I found out was that over eighty percent of the students were willing to pay the extra, sacrifice their Saturdays, yeah. and come for it. Oh, really? Yeah. There was that interest that was created. Because that's what, that's what it's about, surely. Now, how much of that is happening? So, given the fact that you guys have outlined this enormous pressure that the uh, TVET system is pushing us into where we're getting into this, we have to know the curriculum, we have to teach the curriculum, we can't do all the practical activities that are around, we have to make sure that the students do well. How many of the lecturers in your own experience are trying to get beyond that to a point where they're trying to get the students some more detailed, practical kind of know-how and knowing what it is that they're actually working on. Are, are there guys doing it that you know? Their hands are tied, generally. If you I, are in that report one name, one problem, your day is uh, constructed in such a way with the, with the program that you're running for the mm. entire week you don't have that time to be able to do that because the, the lesson that you are free, that same class is involved in another lesson. Yeah. They're going to another lecture. Yeah. So the only time you could probably go and do extra work or extracurricular activities is if you then take it to after hours. And then but so it's crazy. It's not extracurricular activities. It's the activity. But, but Isn't it? But the way I, mean, it's it's I mean, what you're saying is like you haven't got time to do the thing you're supposed to do. Yeah. It's just the way it's, 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 it's led up to this point. Mm -hmm. It's been led. So, like, it's, 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 it's too much pressure. It's too hard on staff. It's mm -hmm. too hard on lecturers mm -hmm. to even go and get that done. So what's the solution then? Well, my, I would like them to change the curriculum slightly. I know people have been this, this fight that, that native should go and yeah, NCV should time. go or NCV should stay. I like the NCV curriculum. Uh, well, not the curriculum. But you, but I, like, I like the idea of it. The practical, theoretical ability to do a bit of both. Exactly. But Mark and I always have this discussion about that the way it's been designed is wrong. Because the whole point of NCV was to give them this practical knowledge. Yeah. And the way it's designed now, all the focus is on the theoretical. Mm. Because yeah. we've got... Uh, no, but the focus in the, in the actual curriculum, it's got the theoretical side that you need, and it's got the practical side that you that you need. Yeah. But you're saying that you don't have any time to, like, oh, from my experience, my subject, the, the the amount of theoretical knowledge is so vast, and with the level of the students we get in, uh, I see what you're saying. It's it's it. There, yeah. There's a must there. Okay. They like. What I, me and, me and myself and Mark, we always discuss this. It looks like they've decided this is the theoretical knowledge. Let's from there take a practical. Yeah. They should have done it the other way around. They should have said, what are the skills that we need for these artisans? Yes. What do we need to prepare them? 
Right. Let's get this practical, that practical, and that practical. Right. From this practical, what theoretical knowledge could go with yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. But then they've given us all this theoretical knowledge and they pull out the practical. It's almost it's as a demonstration, almost as an attempt to say, uh, like, a, this is like an example. It's almost like trying to give you an example. Mm -hmm. Rather than going to the activity and from the activity generating the principles that you need to understand in order to get to the heart of the activity. I, I think the problem there was that you had academic individuals we were trying to design something that was very uh, uh, practical based, but based on artisanship. Yeah. So you, you needed the, the person who comes from that environment, from industry, to have given directions, clear-cut directions on what that expectation is. But I think... No, wait, wait, wait. Say that again. So you, are you saying that when the guys were doing it, they were thinking about guys, the people that were doing it were from industry, should they should have been from industry because if they were from industry they'd understand yes. what the actual functions the were that the application of the knowledge would have been relevant okay now we're looking at concepts etc that are so detailed that if i take all that knowledge myself i don't ever i've never used it i've been in industry for 20 years yeah and so many of the things i'm teaching my students they're irrelevant but now isn't the danger so now let's say I'm let's say now I'm the oak who's designed this curriculum, right? And my response to would be to say, the reason why I put all that stuff in is because we don't want the students to be one-trick ponies. We don't want them to only be able to do one set of things, and that's all that they can do. And sure, then they can do it. They can understand the principles and all that kind of stuff. What we need is we need people who understand the full range of things. So no matter what context they meet they're able to deal with it because they've got the kinds of knowledge which will enable them to get beyond their current context and their current skill into a space where they can do more. That's, that's true. That's, that's very true. That's but you said something very interesting the other day. I think it was you. I think it was you. Mm. Uh, about if you're doing your studies, where do you stop? Where, where do you tell yourself, okay, I'm, I'm only going to limit this amount yeah. of empirical studies that I'm going to take, but it, there's a million of them. Exactly. And, and how do you determine, okay, I'm going to use this and not use all of this. Mm. There, there has to come that, that balance because if you don't determine this is relevant and this is what we need, what's stopping you from using everything? Yeah. So it's almost like if you, if you identify what it is that you need to do and you use that as your base, to then start to think about what the principles are behind it, it might simplify things down. Exactly. And, for, and, and the, also you need to look at NCV, this curriculum that's created, like I'm, I'm going to talk about my subject. Mm. They tell you that when you finish your NCV level 4, it's equivalent to a metric because yeah. we can take grade 9. But if you finish or if you do report 191, N3 is equivalent to a metric. Yeah. And then if you go N4, N5, N6, N6 is your highest certificate. Yeah. And then if you do work experience, you can get it. So N6, N6 certificate is much higher than a level four. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So you agree? No, well, that's... Uh, no, no, I mean, on, on paper. On paper, right. yeah. Right. So my level four students, my subject, my syllabus that I'm teaching as N5 and N6 work in it. Really? So how is that on the same path? The maths in our engineering, the level four maths is N5 and N6 maths, integration differentiation. So you are expecting grade nine, and also at the level two, we can take grade nine learners, but some of the basic work that we are teaching them, a grade nine learner is not ready not for that. close to that. So there is a problem with the curriculum. The curriculum, the curriculum hasn't been designed efficiently enough to see this. But now, the way, so the N5, N6 kind of levels are being, are being taught at level 4. So they're teaching at a metric level. So basically you are teaching, in, and, and that's why NCV is having a bad pass rate. Imagine if I bring an N3 student that they're coming in to yeah. register, yeah. and I start teaching them N6 work at that level. Yeah, yeah. Wouldn't that need no, that pass rate drop? Yeah. It's overkill. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's also the problem we are having. So, 
Do you think that what they did was they crammed a whole lot of stuff from the N programs into the NCV programs and by kind of almost squashing it in? Everything in there. That's what, that's what caused the overpacking of the, of the curriculum. Yeah. And on top of that, they then packed in all sorts of activities because it had to be theoretical and practical at the same time. Now, now, now let, let me ask you this now. That how do you take N6, N5 work, which it, there's a lot of work, a lot of understanding in there. Teach that for the whole year, then throw in practicals. And also get the students to understand and pass the level four. I know how you do it. You give them the executive summary and, the and you tell them to learn the summary. And, but that's what I, for my level four students, I am only focusing on theory because at the end of the year, they are writing this theory paper and they need to pass. I, well, I'm not only focused. Mm. I do the practicals and all of yeah. that. But I would prefer to spend 60% of my time doing practicals yeah. Then focusing on this theory. Meanwhile, what would you at the moment? What's your practical percentage? Twenty percent? Ten percent? It might be even less than that. Really? It might be even less than that. The only time we like focus more on practicals is when my PAT one is due, which is a practical assessment. Uh, okay. So the assessment, the assessment forces the practical. Exactly. Which not which not. Should, which shouldn't be the case. Yeah. yeah. There's one more d major disadvantage when it comes to the NCV and the native program. The N NCV program has seven subjects. The NATO only has four subjects. And so we're dealing with four core subjects yeah. in the NCV program that doesn't get the same amount of time that the NATO program allocates per student. Uh, okay. So so we have less time to do we're doing it and we're doing a bigger curriculum with practicals included. Oh. So you understand that all the challenges that come up with it. Yeah, no, that's that's a massive so and don't forget pass rate mm. so our pass rate mark is 50 percent yes needed is 40 is 40 percent mm. it's, it's so it's, it's a so it's a higher pass rate mm. more work less time. less time more practicals yes ncb was designed sounds fantastic it, it, it was designed to fail <laughs> so you said it was your favorite you said you liked it i i like the concept of it this yes. idea of doing the theory and then matching it with the practical because i come from needed and i know what a difference the practical will make to it. Because they can't, but they... Yeah. Okay. Because the first three months, I, I, I know colleagues and all that, they spend the first three, six months just doing theory, getting it mm. done, getting it out, making sure the work is done. Yeah. And also, now with, with the task that we're getting from management, they want to know, did you do this? Did you know this? Did you do that? So some people are just trying to get it over and done with. Oh, I've done it, I've done it, I've done it. Oh, because now the, the administrative load from the management side is also increasing because they, they need to make sure that they are ticking all the boxes exactly. because they're coming under scrutiny. We, we, we get um, all our POEs and POAs. We have to mm -hmm. fill in all of the stuff. So they want your plan. They want uh, what is your curriculum, I mean your yearly plan. What is your assessment plan? Yeah. And they got these dates and it's like so rigid on this day i'm doing this on this day i'm doing lesson plan i'm doing this mm -hmm. so our staff always fights it they say but what if there's a strike yeah. what if a student doesn't do this so if i'm following this plan and i said i'm gonna do a and i didn't do a so the next day i go and do b exactly that's what's happening in the um current caps story that's exactly what's happening in caps they land up teaching and then what happens is they fall behind but the next week They've actually got to start over there. So you have what's called a potted curriculum. You yeah. keep on hitting potholes in this learner's knowledge because the learner's done this much, then nothing, then this much, and then nothing. And, and, and management plays a big part in whether this, it, you, you can help a lecturer mm -hmm. or you can ruin a lecturer. Because if you have, I always, I say, if you've got a, a management or managers from a practical background yeah. and they understand the difficulty of what we're doing, and when you tell them, I can't them. do this, I can't do that because yeah. of this, this and that. And they understand, they say, okay, right, I understand. Yeah. Make a plan, what can we do? But if you don't have this, and they don't have this understanding, you've got someone who's there who doesn't have the background, mm. they will not understand and they say, do what I say. Yes. Now, yeah, final question. Okay. So now what happens is these students of yours, they're not coming from industry and then getting the theoretical comp component. They're coming without any ex experience of that workplace and what's needed to be know knowing what it is that they need to they haven't got any of that now what they do is they come in they learn all the theory and they do the tests because the tests are all 
the same and they pass the tests. Now, isn't there a situation when they exit your, your qualifications that they can't do what industry requires them to do? And isn't there a big... How are you negotiating that space? I mean, isn't that a very... The, the, I think the challenge is with... Uh, with uh, you know, the different segments that, that covers this entire scope of, uh, of learning, let me put it that, that, uh, that way. We're not talking to each other. We don't have a synergistic relationship. Between who? Between? Between the lecturer, the student, the training body yeah. that oversees this. Because student comes out, uh, what are we doing with that student? How does that student get placed within the yeah. industry? Which industry can take them? Nobody yeah. comes to speak to the lecturer. Give me, who do you recommend mm. from your class? There must be some bright youngsters here yeah. who we can take and utilize because industry still needs people. For sure. But, and they're not talking to us because we are the people who are training them. Are they training, are they training their own people? I've heard accounts of that. I've heard that what they're preferring to do is they take someone in and then they, they do their own in-house training story. In, from the company that I work and I still contract for and do some work for, mm. we've had that case. We've had people who come in with brilliant qualifications and they are not even worth the paper they're written mm. on. And so what that company has done, they have set up an in-house training workshop. Mm. So basically what they've done is, whether you've got N1, N2, N3, N4, N5, N6. Doesn't matter. Doesn't mm. matter. And now we don't want N6 because we found that the N6 student is equivalent to an N1 or N2 student. Knowledge wise. So experience wise. Experience wise. Well ability to do knowledge wise. Because yeah, you've got an N6. We have had cases where you get an N6 student coming in. A lot of the syllabus in electrical is about star yeah. and uh, delta systems. So the actual content, yeah. the actual and knowledge which they need. And we give them a simple draw me a star delta. And they get confused. Or you ask them, draw me this connection, and they don't know how to do it. Because they are so focused in memorizing, mm. like the way we ask the question is slightly different from what they've learned. They can't pick it up. And so we've, we've come up with this idea that whether it's N6 or N2, it doesn't make a difference. But I would prefer N2 student. They got a bit more to learn. Yeah. They, even attitude-wise, they don't have the shoulder on the block, I'm an N6. Yeah. So you take that. And also, and also the, the extra years of learning things off by heart. Mm. And also... Money wise, yeah. I will pay a N2 thing. student less than I would pay a N6 student so in quality. Yeah. Because the way certain industries are set up, if you want to earn more, then you'll do your N4, then you'll do your N5, mm -hmm. then you'll do your N6. So but some of the guys I know, so the friends of mine, the way that they do it is they're working in industry, they're competent at what they're doing, and then part time they go and they carry on with their qualification. And they keep on extending their qualification. That's, that's the class. And the oaks, the oaks that I know, they are diligent. They they work hard. They're making sense of the stuff that they're doing. They're enjoying their work. They certainly speak highly of you guys. They speak highly yeah, of their experiences. Pleasure to teach. That's the main thing. We've I've noticed the difference. If you see when we teach part-time students, mm -hmm. because concepts you can just say it once and they have an understanding you can have a proper conversation about if this in industry i had a problem like this this is what happened i say okay this is the reason you can you can mm. not you don't ever have that browser because they don't have that industry yeah. background and also another reason why is because they are paying with their own pockets yes they appreciate it a bit more that's true and also if the company is paying they have to come they have to attend they have to do what they have to pass yeah so they have to do the work. Yeah. So that's also another factor you have to look at. So what's the ratio of part-time to full-time in terms of the amount of students that you have? In the I haven't taught part-time now for a year, so I'm not sure. Um, it, it depends. The, the minimum number in that class, I think, is 21. Okay. Yeah. But is it like, are you teaching like 80% is like full-time and 20% part-time? Or is it like... No, you know, what are the numbers? In, I mean, I'm assuming most of the guys doing your program are full-time. They're getting paid, through, you know, and uh, what happens is they sit in the system and they do it. Number of part-time students? It, it just depends. Like on a first, like for native, the first block of every year, uh, first trimester is always busy because you're getting all these metric, metriculants coming out. There's no space. 
okay. So then, if you can't get full time, they come and try to do part time, do a couple of courses. Oh, uh, so you, so so. so uh, okay, okay. So so the one thing you have with the part time situation is those that don't make it into the full time come into the part time. Yeah, but we, with the same expectations, no experience, wanting to learn stuff off by heart, etc. So that's a problem, isn't it? And then what's the relationship between those guys and the guys that are coming in from industry who've already got the experience? There must be, is there, are they... You, you can see the difference. They understand faster, they catch on concepts yeah. faster. Uh, sometimes we do have issue with uh, part-time students, not all of them from industry, I can. Uh, some of them have been teaching, I mean, they haven't been learning for the last 30 years. Yeah. So it's, it's a bit of a hassle to get back into, you've got to yeah. do a bit more work. It's like teaching the new students. Mm. So. Uh, you do have your one-two issues, but overall, I've had more pleasant issues with well, guys from yeah. industry teaching them. And you teaching them now, eh? Are you teaching them this year? The part-time. Part-time, yeah. yeah. I uh, it was about a year. Yeah, yeah. With, with us, uh, for the part-time, it's, it's extra pay, so you've got to apply to teach it. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. So, because of our studies and all of that, mm. I've oh, chosen... So you've had, to, you've had to step away from it? Oh, uh, okay. That's very interesting. And are there... Are there antagonisms between the part-time and the full-time students or between the older, more experienced students? Or do they act more like mentors? Do they kind of come in and they see the guys are struggling and they kind of get a group around them and they're like, guys, listen, it's actually like this. You don't know what's going on. Let me help you. I kind of know what's going on over here. And groups form around these oaks to help them out in the longer. I, I haven't, I've never noticed that uh, from all my years that I did part time, all the blocks I did that. Uh, because, really? yeah, because it's half past five to half yeah, past eight. eight. And eight to go. for me, like when I, <laughs> if you work the whole day, you come in at half past five. Mm. And then as soon as that lecturer says, hey, you're done. All I want to do is go. Yeah. Um, because you still got to see your family, you know. So that's why, like, I'm actually very lenient with my part yeah. because I understand their situation. Some of them haven't seen the family all day, the kids all day. So yeah. I try and do as much. Like with us, I sometimes don't even take the first break. Ask the guys, you want to work straight through, and yeah. then leave earlier. So we try and do that. So they don't act in a mental role. Eh? They don't. Do, do they not help the Oaks find jobs, for example? Do they not like, guys? I'm in this industry. You can come, come. Like maybe, but I, I don't, I wouldn't, I haven't heard in it. Yeah, maybe. Like, but they do get up. Yeah. And you see them talking to each other. Yeah. It, it, it's, and, 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 yeah. And, and, and it's not always the case where the older guys, part time industry guys, are helping the younger ones. Uh, it's sometimes the other way around. Yeah, because sometimes the older guys battle would understand. Because, mm. like, if you come into N3 engineering, I mean, mm. in doing that, they haven't. They've forgotten all their yeah. concepts, the maths, the rules, and all of that. Sometimes when we do calculations, we take it for granted. Oh, you should know this basic one. Mm. And we do it, and they get. <laughs> so then the younger ones are actually saying, "No, this is what this oh, is." Really? So I've seen cases. I've actually seen more cases of that. Oh, the other way around, the because guys. you're dealing with the curriculum and you're dealing with the content and you're dealing with the actual. Uh, knowing that this has to go here, and they remember the rules, and they have they, to show they, they them. They might the rules. understand the content, uh, the content of why we are doing this calculation, mm. or what what this machine is for, and what we're doing it for. Mm. But when it comes down to doing the calculation, mm. that might bamboozle them a bit. Uh, that's interesting. So it, it's both ways. I've yeah. seen. Cool. Well, listen, guys. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. It's now Friday afternoon. I think it's time to call this to an end. Uh, but I really appreciate you, Oaks, coming for the second interview. No problem. You're welcome. Excellent.